Ooh. All right, guys, welcome to episode five of the Coaches Roundtable. Um, again, joined by Alex. Um, we've got just a couple of questions this week. We're going to kind of throw in a couple of others at the end just to see how far I guess we kind of get along. Um, and yeah, like, let's kick it off, Alex. All right. Um, start with the kind of broad question. We've got one from Yanar. Um, in the absence of heavy weights during lockdown, how would you keep up strength? Um, sp- I'm assuming that's specific to weightlifting. I think, yeah, like strength could be for weightlifting, could be like more general. Just in well. general. Uh, I mean, I get it's kind of a broad question as well because, like, obviously, what's going to work for you might not work for someone else, but I'll, I guess. I think the best way I guess to attack this will be just to have like a general answer. So the sorts of things that you can do rather than like actual specifics, Mm. I'd say in the absence of um, the weights. So I like intensity percentages of weight on the bar, et cetera, et cetera. You have to realize that you're very limited unless you're Alex and you have a full Aleco set, um, you know, you, you might be very limited in the space that you have to train. You might also be very limited in your, your funds of buying equipment. Um, and also just, you know, you might not want to dish out that sort of money, uh, to, you know, buy, buy equipment. So I, I would say some of the easiest things to do in the absence of, strength would be trying to find ways that you're able to produce the amount of force that you might find whilst doing those weightlifting movements. And I think I spoke a couple of episodes ago about doing things like yielding and overcoming isometrics. And those are super simple. Like all you need is a towel doing things like uh, towel pulls or towel push-ups or towel rows, like stuff like that, where, you know, hopefully the towel doesn't rip, um, Mm -hmm. but you're essentially just trying to produce as much force through the towel, through the floor as you can. So I know it's not specific to handling a bar, but it's better than nothing. I think the other thing as well with, and especially kind of with weightlifting was very specific to speed and if you don't have a bar you don't have access to a bar i think the easiest way to be able to do stuff is just do plyometrics really basic jumps um and also just like some really short sprints like anywhere between zero to 20 meters stuff that's going to be super explosive in nature but doesn't really require that much technical um adjustments i would say just to kind of, I guess, keep it short, those are the sorts of things that I would probably look to program in the absence of the weight. Um, I can obviously expand on that, but before I kind of matter on for half an hour about the same question, I kind of want to hear what you've got to say as well, Alex. Yeah, I think, um, just trying to think. I think, you know, we're unlikely to see a period of time off from training in the same way that we've just recently seen unless you know of course there's another wave or something so kind of like looking towards the future you're probably you know maybe a couple of weeks say you're going on holiday or you know just spending time elsewhere um i think there's yeah there's a number of different ways you can do it um calisthenics is going to be your friend so you know even if you can find you know just like a pull-up bar or a tree branch or something like that you can do you can do a fair bit with that um things like push-ups um handstand push-ups that kind of thing if you've got like some implements around like you know go into you know go into a park or a forest or something get some big heavy rocks like do some strongman stuff start doing some log presses yeah like i think you know obviously you're not going I think it's understanding that you're not going to be able to train to the same level as what you were previously, but any kind of maintenance is still going to be better than no maintenance. Mm. So, um, you know, again, just, you know, body weight stuff is great. Um, you know, things like pistol squats, jumps, that kind of thing. It's just kind of being creative and, um, you know, having a little play with it for a while, finding out what you can do, how you can do it. 
um, and then kind of building a program based on what's available to you. Um, I think as well, I mean, if you know, having a look on like places, you know, j just for getting like cheap stuff like cheap dumbbells or kettlebells, you know, e even just like, you know, a pair or two. And that will suit you really, really well. You can do a lot with that. Um, so, you know, having a look on places like eBay, Facebook Marketplace, yep. or, you know, maybe biting the bullet and going for a set that you've been putting off for a little while. <laughs> so, you know, I think there's, there's ways of kind of working around it. Um, but then also it's like, if, you know, if you can't, there's other aspects um, of weightlifting that you can improve. That's, you know, strength is one component. There's lots of other different components. So, you know, start binge watching hook grip, start buying some books and reading into the theory. Um, start watching old sessions from like the world championships and Olympics. There's a lot that you can do um, with the time off. So I think like be creative, try new things. Um, if you can get some equipment in, that's great. Um, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's kind of, that was actually kind of my second, second point to the answer was, you don't have to like it's i know that in the absence of weightlifting you're looking to kind of get your strength back but you have to realize that as long as you've been training you're going to maintain that to some degree it might not be to the degree where you've been progressively overloading with the barbell and you know modulating your intensity and volume whatever but you know you can to some degree keep that kind of condition as long as you're focusing on some of the things that we suggested but Alex, you made a really good point that technique, technique wise, if you have access to a barbell, it can pay massive dividends when you come back because you've also got to realize that weightlifting is not just about strength or speed. It's about how capable can you produce, how, like, how efficient are you at producing that movement again and again and again and again. <laughs> sorry i just had to sneeze so i wanted to meet my mic mate this hay fever is absolutely killing mm -hmm. me and i don't know why because it's been raining all day but i'm so lucky it never never gets me it gets greg though he really oh, suffers it's it's horrendous but yeah like kind of, as i was saying you know technique is is one massive part of weightlifting and if you can get more efficient at moving the barbell really really well that's going to pay huge dividends when you come back into actually putting weight onto the barbell again when we go back into regular training um you know and and i guess another way to look at that is if you're looking to kind of get a workout from the barbell without any weights well you could do things like complexes you could do slightly higher repetitions that you might usually not do with weights um and i'm not talking like am wraps or whatever i'm talking like you could potentially set a timer for let's say 10 minutes and you do, I don't know, five snatches every 30 seconds for 10 minutes with, with just the bar. And I think that like in itself would be, that would be pretty hard with just a bar <laughs> though, you know? Um, and it keeps the constraint where you're not trying to force yourself to do crappy reps. You're, you're actually constraint is the 10 minutes. You know, if you need a little bit longer, you have a little bit longer, but you're trying to get a good amount of volume in with that barbell um you know as you can even if there's no weight yeah yeah okay, another question yeah let's let's go straight in all right so the one from mark um opinions on splits versus power versus squat jerk and when you tell an athlete to change so uh, <laughs> I mean, the first thing I'd say in respect to that is it, w it, it does very much depend. And I know that is a massive cop out, but, you know, I more often than not, I, I think that the split jerk is a slightly safer option for most lifters. Yeah. Um, I think, and I'll cut, I guess we kind of talk about all of these. Um, in sort of singular entities, but also, I guess, kind of feeding into each other. I think with the squat jerk, and I guess I'm kind of going to, kind of going to go for like a power jerk as well, because although you don't need as much mobility in a power jerk, it is 
almost essentially the same thing. Um, you know, it's like a power cleaner and, and a clean. It is yeah. almost the same thing. It's a little bit different. But by, at it, actually. What's that? That's a fair way of looking at it. Yeah, but by and large, it's... It, it, it's very similar, but there are some subtle differences. Now, the main difference in a squat jerk compared to a power jerk slash split, split jerk is that you, the mobility that is required to get into a squat jerk is a lot more than you would need if you split your feet or you just push under the bar and you catch it into a power position. So I'd say the first thing, if you're looking at squat jerking, is you probably, you know, it... I would say it needs to be learned before you get into bad habits of, you know, having stiff shoulders in the split jerk or or whatever it might be. So I think definitely hip and shoulder mobility plays a big role in should you be squat jerking? Yeah. On like the no point trying to yeah. force it if you're not going to the hip positions. On the flip side, the reason why people might use squat and power jerks is – if we're looking at a split jerk as just a singular movement and it's not the case where we change right to left foot because we usually don't as weightlifters, we, we favor one foot. And if we're favoring one foot, that's might down the low ro- <laughs> might down the road lead to some kind of imbalances between the left and right leg. That's one of the issues. And I, to be honest, I've never really noticed that in myself because I address that by split squats and single leg RDLs and, and stuff like that and but it's coming to recognize that you can't just split jerk off one leg and you know both both legs might not take as much weight um and i think the second thing so i guess discrepancy between left and right is really good for you to be able to get that strength and the jerk between left and right if you're power or squat jerking i think the second thing is technique wise and i noticed this a lot in split jerkers is I think most split jerkers very rarely actually get full extension on the drive mm. because, because they have to come up and split the feet before the bar has even left their shoulders properly. Um, and I'm not just talking like elite because, you know, there are going to be the select few that do this absolutely perfectly, but they're the best jerkers in the world. Like they're the best lifters in the world. But by and large, most lifters very rarely get full extension of the drive. Um, obviously because I've just explained they have to split their feet into the split position whereas in the squat jerk and the power jerk you might actually be able to continue to drive that bar for just a little bit longer so even if you are a split jerker but your coach notices or you notice that you're cutting your extension short in that jerk well then potentially a squat jerk or a power jerk might actually be a really good drill or strength exercise for you to be able to learn actually just driving the bar off and catching it um you know with arms locked out um and i i guess i could go on but i, I kind of want to see what you've got to say and then i guess we'll come back to me because i've got a few other things to say about that yeah, so you can bounce them off the points yeah um i'm thinking like in terms of comparing all three you know again it's going to be very much like based on sort of individual strengths and weaknesses um generally there's a reason why 99% of people use the split jerk and it's just, it's very, very good all round. It's, um, you know, it doesn't require a huge amount of mobility. Um, you, because you're splitting your feet, not just, you know, from side to side, but also front and back. Um, you, you know, if you've made a mistake, if you push that bar forward or to one side or even behind you, um, you can actually adjust for that. Um, whereas like, you know, in a squat jerk, if it's even just slightly in front, not a chance. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So it's got like a little bit more margin for error. Um, I think as well, you can get pretty low in it. Um, I think yeah. generally in a split jerk, if you bottom out, you can get lower than you can in a power jerk, obviously not as, as much as, you know, it's a squat jerk naturally, but, um, you know, so it's just a very good all round way of, um, kind of completing the jerk. Um, some people may not like this, but um, I'd say, you know, the Chinese consider it the most technical of the three lifts and I'd probably agree with them. Um, I think especially for beginners, there's a lot to focus on. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, you've got the dip, you've got the drive, you've got like the timing of the footwork, the correct placement of the footwork, you know, the timing of, 
you know, actually getting under the bar, like, you know, or it's like power jerk is a lot more straightforward or push jerk as well. Again, more straightforward. Um, so I think a split jerk definitely takes longer to learn. And that's possibly why a lot of people shy away from it. And um, I know that I, I think everybody goes through this phase. I know that I did. Um, where I just couldn't get the split jerk for the life of me. And so I was like, oh, should I just swap to power jerking? Because I seem to be a lot better at that than at splitting. And at that time I was. Um, but once I became kind of more technically proficient, learned more about the theory and the foot placement, that kind of thing, the split jerk was, yeah, just one out. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think it's just a question of being sort of patient with it and sticking with it and, you know, just trying to really understand the movement properly. I think, um, unfortunately, in the UK, a lot of people, and actually from the US as well, from what I've seen, like a lot of people don't teach it all that well. Um, again, foot placement was something I struggled with for ages because they just say, just split the feet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How long? How wide? Yeah. Is there like a tempo to it? Because I see some people place their feet at the same time and then some people place their back foot first before the front and then vice versa. Mm -hmm. And, um, but you know, they literally just say, just, you know, split the feet. And, um, you do you, you always see lifters overshoot the back leg and, you know, cut short the front leg. And, um, but you know, you look, you look at the Chinese and the mainly kind of like European way of doing it. I know it's a lot more balanced. Um, so do have a look at that. Um, Cause if you're finding it difficult, honestly, it might, I think nine times out of 10 is usually like a foot placement issue. Um, yeah. Seen anyway. Um, whereas obviously like power jerk, easy, like just move it out. Squat jerk, just move them out. Um, some people just prefer the simplicity of like a power jerk or a squat jerk um you know which is also like fair enough but again because you've not got you know your weight distributed over two planes you're going to get it over one plane um you've got to be technically very very proficient in that dip and drive otherwise you're, you're just going to be losing bars that you shouldn't have any problem getting under um especially for the squat jerk so yeah, yeah and then one thing as well to consider um definitely for the power jerk, definitely, definitely for the squat jerk, is that you're going to need stupid leg strength in order to get out of that. Um, you know, you, you've just attempted a maximal effort clean and, you know, now you've squat jerked under it. Like, <laughs> yeah, have fun, have fun. Just yeah. sure doing a lot of back squats and overhead squats and squat jerks if you, if you want to do it that way. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'd say between the three, um, when you're starting out, do focus on the split, understand that it might take time, um, you know, really kind of try and learn the ins and outs of that movement. Don't underestimate it. Um, but have a play with the power jerk and the squat jerk. Um, you, you know, you'll see a lot of programs will include the power jerk in, even if they're split jerkers, yep. um, solely because it's really, really good for, you know, an aggressive dip and drive, um, for an accurate dip and drive, that kind of thing. So even though you might not, that might not be your preferred method, um, that might be something that you use in your training anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, I had uh, one of my lifters, Keely, um, you know, kind of like a yeah, relative like, beginner intermediate um, over the time that, you know, kind of trained with her. Um, you know, split jerk, like she got on fairly well, but was always struggling with shoulder pain in one shoulder. Um, but for whatever reason with the squat jerk, she didn't have a problem. <laughs> so even though like, you know, I wouldn't recommend teaching the squat jerk to beginners in that case, that was the only way that she could actually jerk. So that's what we ended up with. And, yeah. um, but that said, we still included the split jerk in a program. We'd just be doing like very, very light weights at a point to which like it would be uncomfortable but wouldn't hurt her in order to kind of keep refining it keep attempting keep trying it and now she split jerks so you know yeah. see that for what it is and, um, the thing is with keely as well i want to play devil's advocate is that mm -hmm. she had the mobility required to be able yeah. to try a squat jerk and i think as a prerequisite if you are trying to squat jerk or power jerk with a very limited range in your shoulders or your hips or your upper back you have to realize that if you're not getting in a correct position, you're not going to learn the correct way or movement to do a squat jerk or a power jerk. So honestly, you're probably safer just to stick with the split jerk. Yeah. Um, 
and I guess on the back of what Alex was saying, just to ram it off, and I'm kind of going to play a little bit of devil's advocate here in terms of what you said. I think it's also a case that you have to identify is in your clean and jerk, you have to figure out what is holding you back. Is your clean holding you back or is your jerk holding you back? Um, you know, and if it, if it's your clean, then <laughs> I'm sorry, but you don't really need to worry too much about whether you should change your squat jerk to your split jerk or your split jerk to your power jerk or whatever you want to do. I think the main issue is that you need to, you need to clean, you need to get better at cleans. It doesn't matter. You know, if, if you're not missing jerks, but you're missing your clean or you're getting puffed out of your clean and you, you miss your jerk, then that's an issue that you need to solve by, trying to drive your leg strength up or trying to, I guess, get a little bit more fitness involved to get out the bottom of that clean and be able to finish the jerk. Mm. On, on the flip side, if it's your jerk that you continue to clearly miss, then, you know, you, you, you also have to figure out what that is. And you mentioned it before with the dip and drive. You know, the dip and drive is very similar, I think, in all, all jerks, if not yeah. exactly the same. So with the squat jerk, my understanding is that it's not quite as forceful simply yeah. because you've got, obviously, you know, you don't need to drive the bar as high. Yeah. And if anything, like driving it high actually just gives you more distance to come down with it. and potentially yeah. To power. yeah, like it's not a snatch balance. It's a squat yeah. jerk. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and I, I think, see, I, I would say just to keep things novel in a program, like you were saying with Keely, and I do that with, with a lot of my lifters is I'll sometimes chuck in power jerks. But my question to you is if you're going to put in power jerks to someone who's a split jerker, why not just do push press? Cause you could, I see, I would argue that it's a very similar movement to a power jerk, albeit it's not exactly the same because you're not receiving the bar at fully extended arms. Yeah. But if your issue is you're a split jerker, but you can't finish that extension, but you know, and you're trying to stay nice and balanced over your two feet before you split, then perhaps maybe just a push press so you can stay balanced and you can finish that drive and then you finish nice and tall with the arms. I'd say my, you know, my kind of retort to that, <laughs> that um, you know, I love, love push presses. I think they're, they're quite underrated despite being quite like straightforward movement. Um, but I think like, honestly, with power jerks, it's just like, there's more at stake. Like, yeah. you know, you can load them up a lot more than you can, um, like a push press. Absolutely. And, uh, you're going to get, because you're acting against more weight, you're going to get like more kind of like force development and also it just shits you up a little bit. It's great. <laughs> so push, I'm not scared of push presses. I am scared of power jerks at like 80% plus. So, yeah. you know, it can be, yeah. 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 I'd say like very, very similar. Um, and again, depends on what you're trying to work on. So if it's like, if you want, you know, to work more kind of up, upper body and you want a stronger lockout, push press for sure. Um, if you just want to kind of focus on like the aggression through the movement, um, power jerk might be more suitable. So, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So I, I guess to kind of round up the, off that question is we are both in favor of a split jerk, but, it doesn't necessarily mean that you we, there wouldn't be a case for you to be able to change the jerk, assuming, you know, you struggle with the split jerk because it hurts your hip or it hurts your lower back. You know, I think another reason that you have to identify is if someone's not able to keep their back straight whilst driving and catching the bar here and it's, it's hyperextended, they keep getting back pain. Well, then potentially, you know, if they struggle to actually keep, keep the ribs down as they hold the bar here maybe a power jerk or, or or a squat jerk might be a little bit easier but like we kind of mentioned to start off with this squat jerk power jerk there's a there's a larger margin for error uh sorry a smaller margin for error um and you know so the risk is higher and i think it's it's quite easy to see that if you look at the amount of lifters who are at world champs or olympics how many of them squat jerk and how many people split jerk? Yeah. You know, I know that's not really, I guess, a case to argue, but like, if you think about it, if the, if the elite are doing it that way, then there's it's a like, reason, there's a reason they're doing it. You know, I, I know your mum tells you you're special, but you're not that special. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Stick with the split for the most part. Like, you know, maybe, maybe the other two work for you, but I'd say, 
I'd say to play it safe, try and master the split, get really good at it. And then if it's still not as good, switch to another one. Yeah. And it's not to say that you can't practice those. Yeah. No, like, no, you know, that there's definitely, if you're a split jerker, there's definitely benefits to be doing power jerks. Like we've just said, there's also benefits to doing squat jerks. Like if you struggle in an overhead position in your snatches because of your shoulders, then maybe just putting in some really light squat jerks so you can actually get some more mobility in your shoulders. Now, that could be another reason as to why you might add that to someone's program if they're a, if they're exclusively a split jerker. Hmm. Um, I th I, the last thing I kind of want to say as well is that I don't think people realize how much leg strength you need to have to be a squat jerker. Yeah, <laughs> like you've you've got to realize that your snatch you've you've got three heavy attempts is a squat. Your clean you've got three attempts is a squat. If you add on a squat jerk you're basically doing nine maximal squats. Yeah. Like that, you know, that's, that's a lot, a lot of load on your legs. And if you're not extremely strong in the squat, it's going to be very difficult for you to, um, to jerk as much as you want to, I think. No, I, I completely agree. I think if you're going to try um, squat jerking, you know, and have that as your main lift, um, you need to have like some serious, it's not like serious leg strength, but like a serious reserve of leg strength, yeah. you know, like compared to your main lifts. Like if you get under a clean, if you get under a snatch, you should be able to stand that up. No problem. You know, it shouldn't, shouldn't be any, especially in the clean, like no double bouncing or like, you know, really grindy, like should be straight up. If you can yeah. do that, then like maybe squat jerk, <laughs> but um, you know, the last thing you want to be is like right at the bottom of squat jerk. And then like, you know, can't stand it up or having to you know move, move about the place in order to actually yeah so, yeah lots of spots on your horizon so uh to kind of bring it full circle and uh just to reiterate what i said at the very start of this conversation it depends um <laughs> <laughs> we need that on a tea towel really it depends with <laughs> us just like shrugging <laughs> yeah um i think it's an interesting one though because mm. I very rarely experienced a lifter come up and say like, Hey, I'm not really enjoying the split jerk. You know, do you think I could change jerk? And my, my common, like I, I've, I've maybe had a select few of people where, you know, I've seen them do split jerks and they've come up and said, maybe I should try a power jerk or a squat jerk, or you have a lifter come in and they're, they're a split jerker, but then for, for a week you see them do squat jerks and you go up and you're like, why are you, why are you squat jerking? And they're like, oh, I just wanted to try it. And then, and then you ask them why, and they say, oh, you know, I'm not finishing my extension or et cetera, et cetera. And you're like, well, maybe you should just do dip and drives or dips or push press or potentially just work on a weight that you are able to actually finish that extension in the split jerk so you can actually do it with heavier weights in the split jerk mm. i think people look for like this silver bullet in terms yeah. of like this is the exact like if i'm not a very good split jerker squat jerks are going to fix my jerk that's not if if you're looking at it that way i don't think that's the best way to go about it in fact yeah. i'd argue that it's not a good way at all um you know as we've just identified yeah. solid um Yana has also joined us, so but we've ju literally just uh, answered your question. But obviously, we'll post these on YouTube later, so um, it's all good. Have we got any more? You want to jump in? No, we we have those two. Um, we had um, one that we were discussing earlier um, on the topic of injuries, because okay. um, obviously, you know, basically, um, when do you pay attention? To, when should you pay attention to injuries, and when should you ignore them? I mean, <laughs> I would say, I, I think, to be honest, I think it depends. Um, <laughs> like, I know, I know that I, I answer every question with that, but like, it really does because like you might find, let's say, for example, you wake up and you might have a little bit of pain in your shoulder, you know, it doesn't instantly say that you have an injury, you know, it might just be like a little niggle or it might just be your body's way of saying, you know, I need you to step off the gas a little bit for today. Can we just do something else, basically? And I know your body doesn't talk to you like that, but it, it gives you signals, right? Um, but 
on the flip side, I think it's also a really good indicator if you do if you are getting, you know, little niggles or um you're constantly in pain in an area. I think that's a little bit different. I think when it becomes chronic, that's when it needs to be addressed in a slightly more serious manner. If it's something that's acute, um, and obviously like I'm not a physio, I'm not a doctor, but this is just kind of for my personal experience. If it's something that's acute, usually it's identify what you did the day before and potentially just uh, figure out how you can make it not hurt for the next session do squat jerks do squat jerks <laughs> um but then on the flip side as well um if it's something that is reoccurring i.e it's chronic like it hurts all the time or it's something that goes away but then comes back as soon as you start training then again that's something that needs to be identified um but i more often than not would usually just say to people just see how it goes and if it really does give you like a lot of jip that's a proper english word that is in it jip if it gives you a lot of jip then um maybe either just take take scale it back a little bit you know or we just need to figure out exactly what it is where the pain is coming from and maybe just strengthen that area uh, or the opposite area um, I think without context, it's difficult, but that's kind of the way that I would attack it. Um, yeah. Oh. oh, I don't know. Um... I'll tell you another thing as well to play devil's advocate, because I know <laughs> that I know that this is going to get you fired up is I think some people use stuff like that as a cop out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you, I... you set this up really nicely. Haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> nice I knew <laughs> <laughs> go on we need we need to have like at the end of these podcasts it's just like a five minute you just pick a topic and i rant about it yeah i mean that's basically what we're doing yeah, isn't it yeah, i guess so um yeah fucking <laughs> yeah oh yeah no that drives me mad it's always it's always something minor as well like oh i you know Oh, I walked into a door frame and now my big toe hurts. It's just like, just shut the fuck up and squat. Like, I don't care. <laughs> it's your big toe, bro. <laughs> like, or it's yeah. just, like, oh, <sighs> my elbow feels a bit funny. Or maybe I won't train today. Or, um, or maybe yeah. I'll go light. Or maybe, I'll, well, you know, don't use it as an excuse. If you want to go light, just go light. Just stop, stop messing with me about. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, no, I think there's a difference between like, <sighs> if you've got an injury, and training is not going to make that injury worse, train. If training is going to make that injury worse, adjust your training. So, I mean, that's the question you've got to ask. Um, but a lot of people, it's like, oh, I've hurt, you know, my arm, therefore I'm going to completely write off leg day. It's like, no, <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing? And um, yeah, yeah, so that really, that really does drive me a bit mad. Um, but, yeah, there are, there are some times when, you know, especially if it's like something, you know, you, you mentioned like, you know, kind of chronic pain, um, that can really get you down, not just like, you know, kind of affect your, your kind of programming and, you know, what you set out to do, but also like your kind of mental mood and your approach to training. And um, like in that case, that can be quite difficult to sort of get around. And um, there's obviously like, you know, there's methods for it. Um, you know, again, just like dialing down the training, swapping out exercises, um, grabbing some paracetamol, um, stop being a little bitch, that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> but I knew that was coming. Yeah, <laughs> it was, you know, it's just lined up. But yeah, no, I think, yeah, again, it's, it's, it's just risk versus reward. It's like, you know, and, and it also depends on what kind of lifter you are as well. Like, I think if, you're, if your main sport is weightlifting, or, you know, this is something that like you're doing either, you know, like we don't really have professional weightlifting in this country. Um, but like if you're a coach or if you're, you know, kind of high level athlete, like you're always going to have something generally, you know, obviously there's going to be times you don't, but like you're going to have niggles, you're going to be sore, um, that kind of thing. And if you constantly let that sort of hold you back, um, it's not going to help. It's not going to help at all. Yeah. 
Um, whereas if you're someone who's like, you know, a bit more casual, just doing it for the social, doing it for the fun of it, um, then in that case, it's like, well, you know, if, if training with an injury is going to make you miserable, then don't because you're yeah, not absolutely. doing it to the Olympics, you're doing it to have fun. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's just like, understand sort of, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's risk, it's risk reward really. Absolutely. It's like, what do you, what do you want to get out of training? Um, you know, and how is this, the, you know, how is the pain kind of preventing you or, you know, stopping you from, you know, achieving what you kind of set out to do. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's important to recognize when something actually needs attention and whether it doesn't, um, you know, obviously like stuff that's going on for a long time, um, is not good generally. Um, so do get that checked out, um, see what you can do about that. Um, but you know, even just stuff like sometimes I sleep in really weird positions and like you, when you mentioned about your shoulder hurting, it's like, yeah, cause sometimes I'll be like crunched up like that for the last six hours. And, um, but you know, that's not an injury. It's just, I've been scrunchied. So. Yeah, yeah. You've slept in an uncomfortable position. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, rewrite my session just because of that. So yeah, I, I'd say, you know, just be, just use common sense. And, and if you, you, if you're not sure, because obviously sometimes like, you know, if you're really uncomfortable, you're not feeling great about it. Um, like speak to your coach or speak to your training partner and see, you know, get their opinion on it. Cause they can give you, you know, a pretty unbiased view as well. Um, you know, again, if your coach is concerned or they're concerned and you're not, maybe you should listen to them. Um, you know, but vice versa can also be the case as well. So definitely. Yeah, I'd, I'd say just, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what else to say about that. No, I mean, I th yeah, I think you actually, you said it well. I think we kind of summarized it well. Um, I would also say if, I guess kind of going back to the, if it's something that is recurring, that is actually holding you back from training, and it's not just something you have decided to materialize in your head just to get out of doing something, then it's yeah. definitely worth trying to seek professional advice from someone who actually knows what might be going on. Cause you also have to realize that as weightlifting coaches, our main job is to coach weightlifting, to program weightlifting. There's a reason why physios exist. There's a reason why doctors exist. If, if we didn't need doctors and a weightlifting coach was a doctor and a physio and, 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 a, and a surgeon, you wouldn't need to go to anyone else, would you? They'd be useless. But there's a reason that they're there. So if, if you are concerned about something like that, then you need to get professional advice from someone who knows what they're talking about, not just your coach. Yeah. Um, I would... This is true. Like, you know, just, just for example, like at, the, at the sessions... Um, if I've got somebody who says, oh, you know, this feels weird or this is hurting, that kind of thing. It's like, I might give them some basic advice, but I'll usually say, you know, just go and speak to Johnny or go and speak to yeah. me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, like w w one's a physio and one's training to be a physio. So it's like, you yeah, know. exactly. Well, I mean, the, I, I can't, I can't even imagine a, a countless amount of times that someone's come up to when I've been coaching at the KCL sessions and Prince has been there and I've just, someone's gone, Oh, this is hurt. And I'm just like, Oh, okay. Go speak to Prince. <laughs> <laughs> just don't bother me with this. Go see him. <laughs> yeah. No, then, it's, it's because like, we're not, you know, it's as you say, like our expertise is weightlifting. It's not yeah. physiotherapy. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, obviously like if you're part of, you know, it can be anything, your gym or your little CrossFit box or, you know, whatever you should be able, like there should be somebody who has some, kind of experience um even if it's just you know just ask the staff they'll probably know yeah um if not um you know again like having a look kind of within your local community looking online um that kind of thing to get checked out you know even even your gp um i'm yeah. not too familiar with the nhs but i'm sure that they have some resources for that um yeah yeah solid i think we answered that well mm. um I think I actually had one more. Okay. Just let me find it because I wrote it down a couple of weeks ago on a topic that we were actually talking about, but because we were like talking about it, I didn't want to kind of, I guess, jump in. Okay. Here it was. Mm. So I, I have very small hands. 
as most people know. And I very much struggle when it comes to gripping a bar um, for multiple reps. And so more often than not, when I'm doing things like pulls, when I'm doing things like multiple repetitions of snatches, don't usually do it in cleans, but if it's hangs or whatever it might be, I might use straps. So my question to you is, and I know we'll debate this, when and when shouldn't we be using straps? Okay. Um, I would say, like generally, as somebody with your tiny hands who struggles to hold onto a bar, like grip strength is going to be your friend. Um, so, you know, obviously, like if you're not using straps, you're relying more on grip strength. Um, so maybe you're like prioritizing that over um, kind of using straps for most of your work. Um, obviously, there's going to be times when you do want to use straps. Um, for example, like, you know, if you find that you're getting to a point where your grip is actually slipping and you're losing control of the bar, that kind of thing. But I think for me, like I'd say just, you know, do as much as you can without straps, really build that grip strength. Um, there's lots of like exercises that you can do as well to develop um, that forearm strength. Yeah. Um, even just like stuff that you can work into your sessions. Um, things like, you know, I thought what's a really um, common one that you see is like no no hook, no feet, snatches and cleans, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, for again, for working on that pulling strength and that grip strength. Um, there's, you know, also like forearm exercises, um, little wrist curls, yep. uh, wrist extensions. Um, I think Catalyst uh, or Greg Everett, um, he likes filling a bucket with a load of rice, <laughs> just moving his hands around in that. Yeah, I do the same thing. Have a, have a look at them, um, you know, because that's obviously quite a good one. But, you know, again, like the stronger your grip strength is, I mean, the more confident you're going to be lifting heavy weights. So if that's mm -hmm. a limited factor, um, that's something that you'll just have to focus on more than other people. Um, again, like, yeah, just don't rely too much on straps because that's going to make things worse for you. Um, I'd only, in like, you know, obviously I'm using straps at the moment because I have to put the bar down gently. Um, but in like a general training session, I won't break them out until I'm doing like triples mostly. Yeah. Um, you know, cause once your kind of arms start getting fatigued, that kind of thing, but again, grip strength's never been an issue for me. Um, I've always, I have the same size hands as Connor, um, despite being shorter <laughs> and a female. So, you know, I'm, I'm great. I've got like the equivalent of doors for hands. <laughs> um, so not a problem for me, at least on a ladies bar, obviously with a men's bar, a lot harder. Um, do you reckon we could start a petition to IWF for all the small peopled men, all the small, <laughs> small handed men and just yeah, say, right. can we, can we use a thin bar, please? <laughs> <laughs> like Tian Tao, he always complains about that that's why, true. that's why he's not a big snatcher. Yeah. Cause um, yeah, cause it literally just can't hang on to the bar. Yeah. That's my excuse. I'm sure it's, but to be fair, <laughs> you, you've got like, um, what was it? Um, yo cho. Om Yon Chol. Om Yon Chol, yeah. Yeah. Like, snatching like 135 at, I don't even know, what it, what's the lowest men's weight class? 55? Oh, I don't even know. So he, he can get his hands around the bar for a snatch. So, you know, yeah, so but... like, so Sarah Robles as well talked about this a little while ago. Um, in the, like, have a look at how you're holding on to the bar as well. Yeah. Because... Um, oftentimes you can like really dig it into this kind of area here, like really push the bar into that. And that will give you a little bit more reach. Um, you know, so again, just like kind of maybe play with modifying your grip a little bit and a really like work on your setup so that you're kind of like really digging the bar into yourself. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think that's what I'd say on the topic. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I'm more often than not will lean towards straps. And the main reason is because uh, I've got very small hands. Um, but also I think it's beneficial if you're looking at trying to save grip strength throughout the week. Uh, so if you have lots of pulls or you have deadlifts or IDLs or, you know, whatever it might be, some might argue saying <laughs> it's actually good to, to not train with grip and I'd uh, sorry to not train with uh, straps. And I'd completely agree. 
um, because you know in competition you're not allowed to use straps. But I think on the flip side, you can do more volume of straps. So if it is a case of you know your grip strength is limited, maybe focus a little bit on both. If you get to the point where your grip starts to struggle, you can use straps. But I think up until that point, it's definitely something that shouldn't be addressed just by using straps yeah. in terms of grip. I know what you mean. Um, it's, um, it's, it's like, it's kind of like any other exercise, isn't it? Where you'd want, you know, days where you're working on it and then you'd want kind of back off days, especially yeah. if you worked a lot on it. Yeah. Um, so I think like, was it the Russians as well? They, they tend to use straps, Russians or some some European country, um, where they use straps for um, warm-ups. And then once they get to like the higher percentages, then they swap um, to the hook grip. Yeah. Um, they're using the straps to warm up purely to save uh, their grip. grip. I've, I've um, started doing that. When I came back from Poland, I was like, yep, I'm nicking that. If, <laughs> the, if, if the Eastern Europeans do it, it's good enough for me. No, I think they know a thing or two. Yeah, so. um, yeah I, I kind of just wanted to pose that question because I'm not sure if it had been asked. And I think it's definitely, I mean, I think most people use straps in some form or other. Do you, uh, do you remember my first competition? at Brunel. Um, like, this was like before, you've probably seen videos from it. This no, was I like, don't. This was, I think it might have been before I met you actually, which was a while ago. Um, I hadn't really learned to hook grip at that time. Christ. <laughs> and they'd run out of ladies bars in the warm up room. So I'm there warming up for snatch on a men's bar, no hook grip. And it was just like, some, oh, something. God. And, um, you know, That's same, a nightmare. Same for the clean and jerk. Just like, just <laughs> I, 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 grip, literally. I wouldn't have been with you. That would have been one of your first ones at uh, Brunel. Would have been the first ones that you were when you were at Kings. Yeah. Um, yeah. Solid. Mm. All right. Uh, Prince has just asked one in the chat. Ooh. So basically, um, how do you balance a social life with training? And he's put in particular something like alcohol consumption um I basically i just guess like how do you balance your social life with training hard not i wouldn't say just alcohol consumption but i definitely think that plays a factor yeah um you don't <laughs> no i think the it's, polish would argue with that <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think it's you know again it's like trying to figure out okay um you know, at what point am I? Am I doing weightlifting socially for the community? If so, you're going to put more of an emphasis on like, you know, having fun, seeing people, that kind of thing. Or like, you know, am I trying to be a professional in this sport and get to the highest level? You probably don't want to be drinking every night. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, so again, try, try to figure out where you are on that spectrum. Um, I think in terms of like balancing with the social life, like, you know, weightlifting itself is a very social sport. Um, and you're going to meet a lot of people through it and you're going to make a lot of friends. Um, yeah. I think so, it, can, uh, it can be. Yes. Yeah. Like if you're just lifting in a pure gym by yourself, you might have some difficulties, but yeah. if you're part of a club or, you know, part of a box or something, then, you know, it'll come more straightforward. Yeah. Um, honestly, I think it's like, you know, you can look at it on a superficial level and think, oh, well, you know, if I'm going out with, people on a Friday night, but I've got training on Saturday, I'm going to be hungover and I'm not going to be feeling very well. And I maybe shouldn't do that. But then on the other hand, it's like, if you're building relationships with the people that you're training with and working with, that can be beneficial in its own right as well. Yeah. I um, agree more. So again, it's like, I don't know. It's, it's, it's kind of like, don't be too pious about it. Is yeah. it pious or pious? Pious. Yeah. Pious. Um, yeah, I, you know, again, you know, socials are a big thing at our club. Like, you know, Absolutely. we love doing them because it's that's the community element is a really important factor for us. And um, but because of that community element, people come in more often, they train more often, they compete more often, and so it kind of like pays for itself in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, despite you know, yeah, but yeah, I, I I think in terms of balance, like you you don't want to completely eliminate the social life i think no matter what stage you're at there has to be some kind of room for you know some breathing room 
some time to yourself and your friends where you can just just enjoy yourselves um i think that's important because otherwise you just get too burned out with the sport you know and yeah. if, if, if nobody's come to watch you at competitions like what's the point so yeah absolutely because I, I think, like, I, to be honest, I don't really have much to add to that because that's basically exactly what I wanted to say. But I think the point becomes you have to understand that if you want to be good at weightlifting, there has to be some sacrifice. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't drink all the time. I'm just saying that sometimes there has to be a sacrifice where you have to say, okay, I'm only going to go out for say one drink or how about we don't go out and drink, but we go and do something else like go get some food or we go do this. And I think it's just, it, it's looking at ways where if you want to make that sacrifice, then you need to, to try at least. But exactly like Alex said, not everybody wants to be the best and not everyone is that fussed in, um, everyone's not that fussed in, I guess, the performance aspect of weightlifting, which is absolutely fine. And I guess what you'd say to them is just, you know, make sure that you're still training hard because like, obviously we want you to get better as a weightlifter, even if you don't want that yourself. I think it creates longevity in your sport. Um, but at the same time, realize that if you are going to drink maybe just limit yourself a little bit <laughs> rather than just going hell for leather um yeah. you know i think the other thing that you could you could also argue with is that when i was at uni i hang around i hung around with a lot of groups of friends uh, in my american football team where they were all massive drinkers now luckily enough for me i've never been a massive drinker and luckily as well when I do drink, I'm a massive lightweight. So it doesn't take a lot for me to, you know, have a couple. And then I'm like, yeah, I think that's enough for me. But that works for me. It might not work for other people. Um, and also, it can also be difficult. <laughs> I think if you have friends where you say to them, like, listen, I don't want to go out and drink, but they're making your life difficult by saying, oh, come on, like, why don't you go out and have a drink? It's difficult because you have a moral dilemma to your friends then where you want to please them, but you also want to look after yourself and it's difficult. Um, but I think what helps with that is, you, you know, you have to be honest with them. You have to say to them, well, I'm sorry, but like, you know, this is important to me. If you were a friend, you would understand that. Um, even if you were to just say to them, like, look, I'll come out tonight, but I'm not going to come out for the next three weeks or whatever it might be. Um, and I guess what I'm kind of saying is like, don't allude to peer pressure. Even if you think it's the right thing to do, you have to understand that like, if someone is forcing you to do something, then potentially you need to take a step back and evaluate like, why are you doing that? Are you doing that for you? Or are you just doing that to keep your friends? Because I think, like generally if you sit down with your friends and you explain like you know like Zarko's like this you know where he doesn't drink at all I don't you know he's, he's completely straight edge isn't he no he's not <laughs> yeah he's <laughs> not <laughs> but like you know he, he definitely like tries to kind of moderate it but because you know he's like oh you know he, he's focused on his training and you know that's important to him it's like we don't really that's okay that's fine by us yeah. Um, so I think if like, you know, you sit your friends down, you explain like, listen, you know, this weightlifting thing is kind of important to me. And, um, and, you know, getting absolutely hammered, um, you know, every night or every weekend kind of messes with that a little bit. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to drink as much or I'm not going to drink at yeah. all. Like, I think generally if you've got good friends, I'll understand that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, and again, like some of them will be, you know, quite happy to swap things around. Like, you know, if you might not necessarily want to go out clubbing, um, but going out, you know, to catch a bite to eat or, you know, do something Cinema else. Cinema or whatever, yeah. Yes, well, yes potentially on the cards as well. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, this is one of the things as well is, so uh, I wouldn't necessarily that I say that I have experienced this in myself, but I've given someone this advice and it's worked really well, is they've been in a friend group where, a lot of their friends um, are they they like to go out they like to have like party like drink whatever 
and they he basically tried to explain to them that oh sorry I can't I've got I've got training the next day or you know I'm I'm training for a competition whatever and they never really understood so I suggested to him why doesn't he just invite some of his friends down to train with him so they can understand like the difficulty of what he's trying to sacrifice and that it's for a purpose and I think exactly like you've said and actually you know I just put it in the chat where if you explain to them, they'll understand, they should eventually understand, you know, why you're doing it. Mm. Um, but like I said, it, it's down to communication. If you don't communicate the fact that, you know, you're not willing to do this because of that, then they're never going to know. <laughs> That's true. That's true. So, I think um, I was going to say like, not all alcohols are equal. Some are better for you than others. Some will give you a way <laughs> worse hangover the following day than others. Um, you know, stuff, you know, stuff like vodka. You buy like bottom shelf vodka and it wrecks you. You get the top shelf stuff, it's not quite as bad. So, you know, what I'm what I'm saying is, you know, Russian standard over Sainsbury's basics. <laughs> Take it from me. <laughs> Take it from me. The, to be honest though, and I'll also argue this is on the flip side, when I when I went out to Poland. Mm. Polish team were drinking like every night beer vodka like it was a nuts and they would come in the next day and their training was amazing uh, and that's... like I'm not advising everybody does this because that's just silly but you know <laughs> say you, you want not make the national team if you can yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you become an alcoholic and you do really well at, at weightlifting <laughs> yeah. but the other thing as well is I think what helped with them is they socialized within a very isolated sport where if you're up on the platform, you're there by yourself. And I think the flip side, I think the other, the other half to that is it was their time to de-stress and relax, albeit it might not be the best way, but it was their way. And if they can continue to train like that and they're still performing to the level that they are like, you know, <laughs> So you're saying if you are going to drink, make sure you build a tolerance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying <laughs> absolutely not. Either don't do it at all or just go like full out, you know. Absolutely not. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> do not take that advice from Alex. <laughs> Alex is like one of those people where you have like the good and the bad angel, except <laughs> both of them on Alex's shoulders are bad. There you you have bad Alex and worse alex <laughs> <laughs> either either way it's not gonna end well and this is how my session goes are we doing a session and then i think to myself i feel quite good today should i stick to program or should i max out this one goes you should stick to program but after you've done your session you should just max out this one goes nah fuck the program just max out it's exactly the same no, no, no you, you have missed you have missed one crucial part <laughs> you want to know what that is no, I don't. The max out's already baked into the program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I don't need to worry. I know it's, it's coming up on a Sunday. We're all good. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, I think that's it. There's no more questions in the chat unless anyone wants to type in any more questions. Uh, if not, then uh, I guess we'll leave them till next week. But... Um, I mean, I think we got through, what was it, four, four or five questions? That's pretty good, actually. Oh, solid. Yeah. Uh, so if everyone's happy, we'll, go, I guess, call that an end. Oh, Prince, Prince wants one silly Ooh, one. Oh, let's go. One more. Come on, Prince. <laughs> I'm waiting. Can I mute your mic if you want? I don't mind. Will it be like a quick fire or will it be like a... You know who can drink the most because I've seen Alex drink and she is as much a lightweight as I am. <laughs> Although, <laughs> funny story, mm -hmm. the last time we went out drinking, this was as a club. I thought that Alex had bought me a drink, right? <laughs> and the reason why is because she put it down in front of me, and I didn't realise that she had said try this. Right? I just thought that she'd bought me a drink. So there's me sipping away. I get halfway down and then Keely goes, Alex, did you not want that drink? And I was like, wait, what? That drink was for Alex? Oh, God. <laughs> that was great. It was, yeah, it was me and Keely, you know, of course, me and the Australian, the first ones to head over to the bar. And, um, you know, we go and grab some ciders. And, uh, you know, Connor is, you know, a bit of a madman for cider. 
And um, so we came back, we, you know, we popped, we popped them down and it was like quite a nice one. So I was like, you know, boss, why don't you try this? Yeah. <laughs> Over like, you know, it's kind of everything going on. I completely misunderstood it because he just kind of like took it. And then I was like expecting to get it back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> to be fair, I did buy you another one. And then I bought you another one. And, <laughs> and then another one. And yeah. <laughs> yeah um, anyways, Prince, so yeah, go on. Prince would like to know um, what our favorite games meal is. Go on, Alex. Oh, um, mm, honestly, um, steak, potato wedges and a beer. That's a really nice one. Nice. That's a really nice one. I would say, I, I don't know if I can pick two, but I would say my favourite, I'm, I'm just going to go with, it's not really gains, it's more just like a, I guess my favourite meal would be, Burger, chips, and a milkshake. That would be my favorite gains meal. It's not yeah. really gains, it's just packed with fat, but <laughs> it's nice and it makes me lift. So, oh, it's well. Yeah. Um, all right. I think we'll, we'll cap it there then. So, we shall um, catch you guys in the next one. This is episode five. I can't believe we've got through five already. Yeah. Crazy pretty mad um so thanks guys for tuning in and to the guys who joined in live thank you so much for coming um and we shall catch you on the next one yeah we'll see you then